This is one of the classic questions in southwestern archaeology, and one that archaeologists have been, uh, and the general public have been wondering about, trying to resolve for over 100, well over 100 years. When Europeans, uh, Anglo-Europeans, came into the Four Corners area at, in the late 19th century, they were uh, in awe of these uh, large, empty cities or towns, Cliff Palace being the most famous one. This is a photograph taken in uh, 1891 by a guy named Nord Nordenshield. Today, of course, Mesa Verde National Park is the iconic uh, visitor attraction for southwestern archaeology. Hundreds of thousands of people troop through Mesa Verde National Park. Uh, and visit these amazingly well-preserved uh, cliff dwellings dating to the AD 1200s, which were, which people left, uh, as Bill pointed out, the last people probably left or didn't survive there around 1280. So between about the, say 1240 and 1280, you have a very substantial migration of people out of the area. So the question is, where did they go? Why did they leave? This is a classic uh, historical question. Um, and of course, everyone's interested in, uh, you know, historical mysteries like this. And my talk will probably leave you uh, really convinced that it's still a mystery. But, uh, you know, we may be able to uh, make some progress. I think we're making some progress here. The best that archaeologists and historians can do with these historical questions, which are also always have multiple variables which interact in complex ways. So if you ran the tape again with all these variables at play, it might not come out the same. Uh, so the best we can do is talk about and try to be as evidence-based as we can about what happened and maybe how it happened. Um, and try to come up with some plausible accounts, some plausible reconstructions of why it might have happened. And this is true of the, you know, this is true of uh, understanding the uh, fall of the Roman Empire. You know, Mr. Gibbons over 200 years ago wrote six big volumes uh, wrapping up that question. Well, people are still arguing. I read a book the other day about uh, the fall of the Roman Empire. So they're complex questions. They take place over periods of time, tens of thousands, if not uh, hundreds of thousands of people involved, all with their own agendas and so forth. But by clarifying what happened and maybe how it happened and when it happened, we may be able to reduce the space available for those plausible accounts and eliminate some of them. So that's where I'm coming from. Bill's already showed this uh, slide. Um, again, I'm talking about the Mesa Verde population here, not the Canta. Uh, Jeff Clark and Patrick Lyons have done a brilliant job of, uh, with, the, with Archaeology Southwest of detailing where these people went and, and how visible they were in the aftermath of leaving the Four Corners area in the late 1200s. That's not the case with the more populous Mesa Verde group, as, as I'll show, the archaeology, uh, they're hard to trace archaeologically. There are other lines of evidence that indicate a lot of them, at least the ones in the most populous part of the area, probably went to the northern Rio Grande, this uh, blob here. So these, uh, these maps, uh, the darker the color, the higher the population density, the lighter the color, the lower. Po so it's kind of a contour map of population density at different points in time. This work was done by the uh, by Archaeology Southwest is a brilliant piece of uh, compiling uh, research uh, that I keep coming back to for you know, a number of uh, stories I tell. So uh, th this doesn't mean that there are not some people living in some of the uh, intervening spaces here, but the population density isn't high enough uh, or the sites are too small to register on these maps. These guys were just compiling data on sites that had more than 12 rooms which doesn't sound like many, but there are plenty of habitation sites in the Southwest that don't have 12 rooms. But just a quick uh, review here. Here's uh, 1250 to 1300. Lots of people in the Four Corners area. They're gone by 1300, really by 1300. 
Things rock along here, uh, 1350 to 1400. Big concentrations down here in the desert, Mogollon Rim, Upper Little Colorado. Here's Hopi, here's Zuni, here's the Rio Grande. Then there's a, another big break in uh, 1400, 1450, the Mogollon Rim country goes down. People leave that country. And then the next step, the desert goes. There's still uh, low density populations in some of these areas, but uh, the bulk of people have, have gone. And uh, I think this means that the surviving farming populations here on the Rio Grande, Zuni, Acoma, Zuni, Hopi, absorb people not just from the north, but from other areas as well. But that's, a, that's another story. There, there are a number of migration stories to be investigated and told here. And I'm concentrating just on, uh, on, on this one. Again, here's a, uh, a bigger scale map. Here's the San Juan River. The San Juan drainage uh, was kind of a, a core of early farming populations. Um, it has some distinctive cultural characteristics, some of which I'll mention a little later. Here's Mesa Verde National Park. This is what I call the Central Mesa Verde region, or what people call the Central Mesa Verde region. This is the most populous part of the area by far here in southwest Colorado, between Cortez and about Blanding, Utah. Population, Mesa Verde people, making the same kind of pottery and architecture, extended all the way over here to the Colorado, to what's now Lake Powell, but uh, the population density was much lower. And then, of course, you have Aztec ruins and some, uh, some big uh, populations down here uh, on the San Juan and farm And then Chaco Canyon in the southern San Juan drainage was uh, a, an area that boomed in the uh, 1000s and 1100s particularly, but was occupied for a long time and into the 1200s for that matter. Uh, you can see the uh, present day, some of the present day Pueblos. Here's Hopi, Zuni, Zia, Acoma, and then a whole string of Pueblos here in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Rio Grande. The, the measurements here, the, the, the radii are from Cortez, which is kind of the center of the uh, central Mesa Verde population, just east of uh, Mesa Verde National Park. It's Peter Pino at Cliff Palace uh, giving a presentation, uh, talking to a group from Crow Canyon Center. Uh, most of the Pueblo groups have, all of the Pueblo groups, I think, have some uh, stories about having an ancestry up in the San Juan uh, and often in the northern San Juan, the Mesa Verde region. But I think most of them also have more complex histories than that. But certainly the Mesa Verde region figures prominently in their own histories. A little bit of background here. Maize is absolutely, you know, the, these, the slides we were showing were farming populations in the southwest. So farming, maize growing, was what people were doing. That's, that's how they subsisted, and that's how their populations grew, was by growing and eating maize. So maize comes in from Mexico into the northern southwest by a pretty early, 2000 BC. It's uh, in, the, in the Mesa Verde region, people were dry farming. That is just planting and living on the, having their crops be supported primarily by rainfall. Some runoff, some floodwater farming, but mostly dry farming. So it has limited, has fairly uh, rigorous requirements that are pretty close to the margins there. 12 to 14 inches precip per year, about half in the growing season, 110 to 120 days of growing season. So the higher elevation you get, the more rainfall you can get, uh, but the shorter the growing season and vice versa. So these people were kind of, in a little niche there where, where they were living where there was enough rainfall uh, and a long enough growing season. For actually a fairly limited part, limited elevation band. People were dependent on maize for their subsistence in the southwest in general by 1000 to 500 BC. And then it really begins, you really begin to get population taking off, uh, becoming large in various areas, 500, to 500, 500 BC to 500 AD. Um, the Pueblo II period, 900 to 1150, one of the distinctive features about that, and Art, Art Roan here tells me he's got a book coming out on Pueblo II, so we will, uh, you know, that'll be the full story.
But this, uh, one of the notable features here is this uh, string of very large sites, unprecedented large masonry, multi-storied uh, sites in Chaco Canyon, which is not, doesn't look like a very prosperous place to grow corn. But lots of people lived there and they developed what I think was the most complex, uh, politically, economically, socially complex society in the Southwest. It was their experiment with um, a bit of hierarchy and uh, uh, a bit of complex uh, society um, that kind of got short-circuited by a major drought in the mid 1100s by my, by my reading of that history. So they had these big centers, which were probably ritual, political, economic centers, and also surrounded by a more typical, much more typical, small, one-story, built one room or one b little batch of rooms at a time, uh, surrounded by lots and lots of small sites like this. And of course, this is an isolated Great Kiva Casa Rencanada, if you've, uh, if you've been to, to Chaco. But these are very elaborate uh, by Southwestern, by previous Southwestern standards. Uh, the Chaco tended to decline in the mid 1100s. And in the 100 years or so that followed that, there was a boom up in the Mesa Verde region, up north of the San Juan, up in southwestern Colorado and southeastern Utah. This is looking off the northern escarpment of the Mesa Verde proper, out toward uh, Cortez, Colorado, and Ute Mountain, and over to the LaSalle Mountains. This is a area where there's commercial dry farming today. When there was enough rainfall and the growing season was long enough, this was a real breadbasket for the Pueblo world. And it supported, particularly in the 1200s, a population, the late 1100s and early to mid 1200s, a real population boom. And that, in many ways, set the stage for the population bust that followed at the end of the 1200s, although other areas were going down as well, so that's, it's not just a Mesa Verde story. Uh, in the 1200s, th that's when most of the uh, classic, iconic cliff dwellings were built, where you have natural shelters like this, uh, people who were moving into larger villages in the Mesa Verde region built at least part of their housing in these natural shelters. It's a more, uh, more uh, complex task to build there, but the maintenance costs were low. These things are still there after 700, 800 years. So, um, the larger settlements in the early, 12, early to mid, really mid to late 1200s were at the heads of canyons, often around springs. This is an artist's reconstruction of San Canyon Pueblo, where the Crow Canyon Center worked for years in the 1990s. It's about 400 rooms, about 90 kivas. It has some interesting, uh, what we would call public architecture. This is a big D-shaped building. Here's a great kiva. There's a plaza. And there's a little area, there's a, a room block that looks like it's a, uh, it's a storage uh, complex. Whereas most people, uh, in, in this culture, we're storing their own food in their own household storerooms. Here's one that, you know, must have been managed for at least some larger segment of the community. Uh, again, pretty unusual, and this kind of thing comes into... The Great Kivas have a long history, but these big D-shaped buildings in the Mesa Verde region are relatively late. So they're playing around with some uh, public architecture here that probably indicates, uh, you know, some new ways of managing uh, groups of people as large as four or 500 people living you know, close to one another. The historic pattern in the Mesa Verde, all over the San Juan really, was people living in little uh, settlements, household or a couple of households, out close to the farms, dispersed, pretty much like uh, rural farmers live in, uh, in, uh, in much of the uh, US today, living close to their fields. So the big villages, whether they're cliff dwellings or canyon head complexes, those were, were unusual. They, did that, they also did that in the AD 800s, and, uh, but that's a different story too. So, but most of the time they were living in dispersed uh, small site settlements that were flexible, um, flexible settlement pattern. They could pick up and move if the, uh, you know, if the little, little variations in rainfall uh, were affecting their farming. This is what's called, a, we call a prudent unit named after 
Theophilus Mitchell Pruden, who was a pathologist from New York who came out and did archaeological surveys in the 1890s and early 1900s, a really smart guy, and he recognized that this complex of a few surface rooms and a circular subterranean kiva, here you have a kiva, and you have some associated, actually a couple of kivas at one of the uh, cliff dwellings, that these were kind of a unit, a habitation unit, that repeated over and over. Uh, most of the sites were just one or two of these units. But when you got the, in the 1200s, when you got the bigger villages, they also had, you know, they were made up largely of a bunches of these things stacked together. One of the things that's interesting and I think characteristic of the San Juan, both north and south, is that these small kivas were really both domestic and ritual spaces. People actually lived in them. The archaeological evidence is absolutely clear that people were cooking, eating, probably sleeping there. Uh, in, in many cases, these late sites, there aren't even hearths in the surface rooms. So they're really pit houses uh, with ritual features. Uh, analogy, uh, analog might be the Navajo Hogan, which is a uh, living structure, but it's built to a ritual prescription. And that's where you have to have uh, certain kinds of ceremonies because it's, it's how changing women told, told people how to build their houses and their, their spaces that are, are sacred as well as domestic. Here's, a sh here's another reconstruction, computer reconstruction of uh, San Canyon Pueblo again. You can see these things that look like uh, sundials or whatever. These are supposed to be the roofs of kivas with ladders sticking out so the shadow gets cast across the roof. So you can see how many of these uh, kivas there are. The typical ratio in these late sites is about one kiva for every five, four or five associated surface rooms. And they're little, they're little units. Then you have these uh, sort of uh, community features, the plaza, the, the D-shaped building, the great kiva, the storage complex, and so forth, that must have been managed uh, probably by you know, religious authorities on behalf of the community or on behalf of some segment of the community. It's an interesting pattern. And they're, they're what, we, what Eric Reed years ago called front-oriented. They face a certain way. The trash is disposed of uh, toward the front, uh, usually toward the south, although they will adapt to topography in the case of these canyon head things. Um, they also have uh, walls around. This has uh, towers on the, on the perimeter and so forth. Uh, but they're, and they're usually bilateral. The, this is, seems to be entirely residential. This seems to be where the, the public facilities are. So they have a, a bilateral somewhat symmetrical, but not entirely symmetrical organization. So the layout is distinctive, and it's a distinctive San Juan kind of, kind of pattern. Well, my colleague Tim Kohler at Washington State and a bunch of associates, including uh, archaeologists from the Crow Canyon Center, have been doing a major study in an area, they call it the Village Project, um, the Village Ecodynamics Project, NSF funding a major area here in the heart of the central Mesa Verde area. It's about 2,000 square kilometers. It's just outside Mesa Verde National Park. Cortez is here, Dolores is here, Canyons of the Ancients National Monument, and so forth. They've done some good population reconstructions based on pulling together existing survey data and doing some additional survey data that show this uh, boom and bust I was talking about in the AD 1200s. And this is, of course, just part of the central Mesa Verde, which goes all the way over to Blanding here. So it's a, it's a good sample, but it's not the whole area. This is just a, the main thing to notice here is that you have a, a boom, a small boom here in the 800s, the Pueblo I period, then a real decline, and then a ramping up in the late 1000s and especially in the 11, late 1100s and 1200s, and then a rapid fall off. These are three different estimates They're based on uh, the estimates here are couched in terms of households, but in terms of number of people, if you take the, the three estimates, they range from 15,000 to over 26,000 people. And this is just one part of the, of the um, central Mesa Verde area. I remember Art Roan made an estimate, you estimated something like 20 or 30,000 people, 30. This looks pretty good, you know. It looks like you may have been uh, lowballing it. Nobody, uh, nobody believed it at the time, but. 
<laughs> yeah. Did a similar thing uh, on different criteria. Yeah. It's kind of nice to all agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, you had your site use lives wrong, but you know, but <laughs> but there are a lot more sites than you knew about. <laughs> so it worked out. <laughs> they canceled each other out. Anyway, back to this map. In the late 1200s, and by the, the latest treeing date, I think, the latest anybody was doing any building up there, as far as we can tell, was about 1280. And the building drops off dramatically in the late, in the late 1270. So it's a rapid decline of, of building. Of course, the treeing people are what, in part, keep us in business. It gives us some of the best archaeological history. And Bill Robinson there is responsible for a good bit of that. Some of the best archaeological history in the world, not just in the Southwest. But um, the Cayeta uh, population over here, um, northeastern Arizona, seemed to have headed south. Some of them ended up all the way down in this, here in the Tucson area. And we think that on multiple lines of evidence that probably people from the central area here, the most populous area, probably primarily went to the Rio Grande, although some of them have gone to other areas that were building population. And over here in the west, these sort of frontier Mesa Verde people, I bet some of them went to Hopi. But, you know, I want to focus on the um, Rio Grande, the, the Mesa Verde to Rio Grande story. That's where we have the best evidence. And I'm following along here with uh, a, a really good study completed, soon to be published by Scott Ortman at Crow Canyon. This is a book coming out, University of Utah Press. If it's not out already, it'll be out soon, where he traces the, the, uh, the Central Mesa Verde people uh, to the northern Rio Grande, particularly the Tewa-speaking uh, people of the northern Rio Grande, doesn't mean that some people from Mesa Verde didn't go elsewhere as well, but there's strong connection with Tewa. So um, here is Frijoles Canyon, the Pajarito Plateau in the uh, northern Rio Grande. This is one of the areas that was building up in the late 1200s when um, Mesa Verde was declining. Some of the reasons. Um, some of the things that made this attractive, um, summer rainfall was more reliable. The, the summer monsoon weakens as you go north and, uh, and west from, uh, northwest from Albuquerque. Um, it's an uh, it's important component of, of, corn, of corn farming, having rainfall during the growing season. So having more reliable rainfall would be important. And there, you know, there's a long history of uh, some general similarities between the Pueblo people in the Mesa Verde region and the Pueblo people who were living at the same time in the Rio Grande. This whole area, as you saw in that first slide, the whole area from the deserts on up into Utah and Colorado was populated by farmers. So it wasn't that all the people were in the, the Mesa Verde region. Well, multiple lines of evidence linking central Mesa Verde area and the Rio Grande. Scott has worked out some linguistic evidence that I won't go into here, partly because I I sometimes understand it, sometimes I don't, but it has to do with, uh, with uh, linguistic metaphors like the earth is a bowl, the sky is a basket, that appear in things like Kiva murals, um, pottery, and also in the Tewa language today uh, that indicate a, a connection. And there's some, uh, there's some Tewa, uh, some of the uh, early 20th century archaeologists recorded uh, Tewa knowledge of specific sites up in the Cortez area, the site that's called Yucca House now, which is uh, one of the least visited national monuments in the entire park system, it was originally called Aztec Springs. And uh, a guy, an archaeologist named uh, Jensen, uh, convinced uh, uh, Jesse Walter Fuchs to change its name to Yucca House, which is the, T the Tewa name, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Present day oral traditions I've already mentioned. There's also Spanish accounts of a place they heard about from the Indians called Tewayo, which is north of the San Juan, up in, you know, Utah, Colorado, somewhere. Tewa, that just means big Tewa place. I think that's just the Spanish in the 1600s and 1700s uh, recording what the people had told them. Uh, most of the documents you get are uh, various Spaniards trying to use uh, trying to raise money for an expedition up there because they were sure that that's really where the gold was. It wasn't where they'd been so far, but uh, it's bound to be gold up in that, uh, up in southern Utah somewhere and, and southwest Colorado, but they never made it. 
biological evidence, this is very strong. Ortman pulled together metrical data from uh, uh, studies done over the years um, that the, si the, the similarities between Mesa severity skeletal populations and northern Rio Grande skeletal population increased substantially after AD 1250. That is, they're much more alike. And his inference is that it's because lots of people move from the Mesa Verde area to the northern Rio Grande. Demographic trends, population drops uh, strongly, in, population increases strongly in the northern Rio Grande, Rio Grande, same time it decreases in the Mesa Verde area. And it's the archaeological evidence that's the weakest because the classic Mesa Verde archaeological complex, mugs and cliff dwellings and uh, uh, front-oriented Pueblo, it drops off the map. It doesn't show up anywhere. Unlike the Cayeta case that Jeff uh, and others have documented where you can trace some elements of architecture and material culture all the way down to the San Pedro. So that's what I want to talk about next is the, uh, oh, what I want to talk about next is, here's these multiple variables, okay. <laughs> what are, uh, typically when, uh, when uh, social scientists talk about migrations, they talk about both push factors, things that were making people miserable where they were, and pull factors, things that were attractive. Push factors are, uh, you know, climate, warfare, uh, the aggregation of larger villages that made the settlement pattern less flexible and adaptable. I want to throw turkeys in here as a factor. I'll get to that later. <laughs> These guys were very heavily reliant on maize. And, you know, the, the new forms of public architecture and so forth may be, you know, all, we're, all we have to work with as archaeologists is material evidence. But I think those indicate experimentation with some new forms of, uh, of, uh, of leadership, religious or otherwise. And I think that during this period in the 1200s, uh, warfare, which would, has always been around, I mean, there are people, people have, have fight each other, but uh, I think there's what, what uh, archaeologists sometimes call a pure polity competition gets going. These little village complexes of a few hundred people, 200 to, to 900, let's say, they're competing with each other for followers and probably for, uh, you know, robbing each other of various things. And uh, it's one way the leaders get uh, established as leaders is by uh, leading people to success in warfare and uh, by attracting followers. So I think they're you know, developing some competition of that sort. I don't think there's a single central hierarchy. You know, like you're looking, we're talking about uh, several tens of uh, little, more or less independent little political units built around uh, uh, Canyon Head villages. Pull factors, I mentioned more reliable summer rainfall. In the areas to the south, um, in New Mexico and Arizona, in the, in the upper little Colorado, and beginning in the Rio Grande, some different forms of community, or, community organization that may have been attractive. And undoubtedly, they had a religious component. Um, but they weren't uh, just an elaboration of the San Juan pattern of lots of household kivas and D-shaped structures and front-oriented pueblos, very different kind of look to it. Uh, Scott Ortman, uh, kind of looks at this as a uh, perhaps a cultural revitalization movement that hit the uh, Mesa Verde world, an opportunity for sociocultural renewal, renewal. Things were going bad. People need to move to clear the slate, uh, clean the slate. And movement, of course, is a common pattern. I mean, if you tr the better the dating we get, the more we see how, ra how, qu how frequently people did move, usually small scale, from one farming, local farming area to another, but sometimes whole mesas, uh, sometimes in this case, whole regions. So movement is nothing new to these guys. Okay, climate change. Uh, A.E. Douglas in the 1920s recognized there was a tree ring signal, he's the inventor of tree ring dating, invent, and recognized a signal of a big drought starting in 1276. He called it the great, great drought and wrote in National Geographic, one of the all time great uh, titles for an article, uh, Secrets of the Southwest Solved by Talkative Tree Rings. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a great title. Well, it turns out that that drought uh, is there, but it was part of what uh, climatologists call a mega drought, covered a huge area. This 
hot red blob here shows that. Covered the whole mid, middle and western part of the, uh, of the country. So it was a serious drought. But however, no more serious than the one in the mid-1100s that people in the Mesa re region had made their way through. You know, they, they were not uh, probably growing much at, at that time, but they got through it. Here's another tree ring based reconstruction. This one is uh, Colorado River flow. The point I'm, I really wanted to make here is that it looks as if uh, population was beginning to f leave the central Mesa Verde area before 1276, before this drought really hit full scale. Um, tree ring dates, tree ring building declines, and it looks as if people were beginning to move out, perhaps as early even as 1250. Um, this is another tree ring reconstruction of the flow of the Colorado River. This is going to be based on snowpack in the uh, southern Rockies. It's going to primarily indicate winter precipitation. Here at 1200, you have a peak of precip, winter precip, and then it declines all the way through the 1200s to a real severe low about 1300. So this suggests that at least the winter component of moisture, which would have been important for dry farming, may have been getting worse all the way through the uh, 1200s. However, here you have the mid-1100s drought, which as I indicated, they got through, but with smaller numbers of people um, than they had in the 1200s. Okay, warfare. Um, here's a, a, uh, a dig that the Crow Canyon Center did around this uh, little formation called Castle Rock. And they found that uh, this was a small little community. Here's a computer reconstruction, some kivas, some towers built around this, uh, this, this uh, prominence. But probably everybody who lived there, or most of the people, maybe 75 people, were massacred. Now, this is based on sampling um, of the uh, test pits, basically, but it's, it's an extrapolation from what was found, not a wholesale excavation of burials. Um, so it was, um, again, probably local warfare, not, no evidence, that, uh, no credible evidence to me that people were coming in from outside the Central Mesa Verde area and dominating. People were fighting each other and times were getting worse and it made people miserable. This was probably in the 1270s. There's no evidence of any reoccupation here, although people evidently had come back and and had come in and rebury and buried some of the some of the remains from the massacre. Just some examples of defensive sites over in southeast Utah. This is Ricky Lightfoot, former president of Crow Canyon Center. Um, this is not the reason he's former president. He, uh, <laughs> he was uh, he was smart enough to back off and not make it all the way in there. And this, interestingly enough, is uh, Dave Wilcox when he was still a graduate student at University of Arizona. Large villages. I indicated the, uh, the typical settlement pattern throughout the San Juan was people living in relatively small units, uh, one or two kivas, um, close to their fields, maybe with a uh, room block that had more people living in it, maybe with a great kiva as a community center, but dispersed communities. Um, but large villages began to grow in the late 1100s and 1200s. And by the by 1270, most people were living in, most people who were in the area were living in these really large villages. Cliff Palace, we've seen several times. This is, a, this is the largest site in the region. It's an aerial shot. This covers several hundred acres. These little dimples here are all Kiva depressions. These are room blocks. It's kind of a street down the middle. Probably 800, 900 rooms here and 150 Kivas. Lots of people living there. Um, so um, again, this uh, sort of limited the, uh, the kind of adaptive response that people had by moving when things were not working out on their local, local, local field. Turkeys, got to bring them in. Um, the, one of the effects of larger villages and larger population overall was that they hunted the game out. We have good, good evidence, uh, both from modeling and from the record, that. Uh, game became increasingly scarce in the vicinity of the settlements um, uh, at, at levels of population well below what we think they reached. Uh, so they turned to turkeys 
They had been raising turkeys for hundreds of years, probably primarily for the feathers. And that's a different story, but uh, they turned uh, really relying on them as a animal protein source in the late 1100s and 1200s. And that meant um, they had to feed them corn. They had to, they had to keep them, keep them uh, control their breeding, keep them and feed them corn and provide fresh water. Turkeys need, uh, need fresh water. So that's another strain on the, uh, on the system. So I think of this period as, uh, I call it out on a limb. Um, they had a population with an all-time high. Uh, data indicate they were getting over 80% of their nutrition from maize. Warfare encouraged aggregation, which limited their previously successful household level movement strategy. Had new forms of community organization, perhaps uh, rivalry among these peer polities in the area. Uh, uh, promoting particular kinds of leadership as indicated by uh, public architecture. Reliance on turkeys that put more pressure on the farming system. So, you know, things were, um, were kind of on the edge and when the, uh, the climate trigger um, got pulled, you know, in the, in, the, in the 1200s or got bad enough, uh, it may have uh, uh, kind of uh, set off a cascade of movement. Um, Again, there, I think there had to be a uh, socio-religious element to this. I mean, otherwise some people, more people would have stayed or they would have repopulated. It had to be a, a kind of cultural movement, I think. That Scott has some ideas about this. This is one of the kinds of things that archeologists uh, know from reading history happened, but it's darn hard to track archeologically, generally. Okay, the pull factors, uh, reliable summer rainfall, growing seasons. They already had relationships with the northern Rio Grande. Um, you know, um, uh, Santa Fe black and white's not all that different from uh, McElmo black and white. You know, they obviously were in communication with each other. Probably had relatives down there. And uh, one of the murkiest part of this is that I think there were some new forms of social and religious organization that were being developed in the little Colorado and Rio Grande areas uh, earlier. Uh, by the end of the 1100s, you begin to see some of this, particularly in the Little Colorado, not so much in the Rio Grande. One of the things that suggests they were, that the Mesa Verde people were receptive to new ways of doing things was that they gave up many of their traditional material culture patterns. Art artifacts such as mugs, kiva jars, classic Mesa Verde decoration, and so forth, but also some elements that seem to represent uh, social organization, community organization, such as the small household kivas. These just drop off the map. Um, so do D-shaped buildings and front-oriented village plans with bilateral layout, peck block style masonry, which typically is used, you know, sort of in public, in walls that front on public areas and so forth. So very different from the Kayenta example that, uh, that Jeff and Patrick Lyons have talked about. These guys seem to have uh, adopted a strategy of blending in with existing Rio Grande communities and perhaps because they were attracted to some of the ways of doing things that were emerging down there. Some of the things that didn't make the trip, this is a big D-shaped building at Mesa Verde, towers, Classic Mesa Verde black and white pottery design, mugs, so-called kiva jars, and oddly enough, uh, a particular kind of scraper made from a deer bone. I, I, it's hard to see that as uh, being uh, of ceremonial or social organization importance, but uh, they just don't show up much uh, outside the San Juan drainage. Small household kivas, I think that was uh, a big, a big change. The individual households giving up their access to the ultimate sacred symbols. The kiva represents the, the ultimate Pueblo origin story of the emergence of people from below. They have sipapus. This was places where, these are places undoubtedly where important ceremonies were performed. And they were belonged to individual households. Instead, in the Rio Grande, they tend to go to the community rather than to households. Well, what kind of community organization did, uh, did the uh, Mesa Verde migrants sign on to when they settled in the Rio Grande? The earlier ones, in the early and mid-1200s, 
seemed to have seem, had a pattern of dispersed small habitation, not unlike that was, they were re sort of returning to the kind of dispersed farmstead pattern that they were familiar with from they at least they or their parents were familiar with from the Mesa Verde region. So this is a small site. This is this is kind of a unit little unit pueblo on the Pajarito. However, they adopted Rio Grande styles of kivas, very different kind of construction, different layout, and the directional orientation was tended to be east, whereas in the central Mesa Verde region, uh, south to southeast is a real strong directional orientation that must have had important uh, uh, religious uh, uh, symbolic meaning. By the late 1200s, plaza pueblos were becoming the norm in the northern Rio Grande. This is a site that on the Pajarito near Santa Fe, near Española, that my colleague uh, Tim Kohler excavated back in the uh, 1980s. This is um, a small one, but it has a lot of rooms. A lot of people live there, multi-storied. There's a single kiva in the plaza. It looks in, it's not front-oriented, it looks in to the plaza. It's, uh, it's oriented to the center. So it's a shift away. And, and this kind of, uh, of uh, organization, kind of spatial layout, shows up in the Little Colorado. And there are people here who can uh, be much more precise about that than, uh, than I can. It seems to me it, it shows up earlier in the upper Little Colorado region, uh, the Mogollon Rim country and so forth. So it, it's something that was coming into the Rio Grande or being adopted and developed by people in the Rio Grande, whether they were already there, or whether they were indigenous, or whether they were migrants. Everybody was signing on to doing, laying out uh, sites uh, differently. Very rapidly, early 1300s, you get really huge plaza-oriented pueblos, sometimes with multiple kivas, as in this case at Arroyo Hondo near Santa Fe. But the plazas all look in. They look to the center that the kiva is something that goes with either the community or with a large group of people. The sacred symbols don't, aren't parceled out among individual households. So I think that, um, I think the old San Juan pattern was one that emphasized the autonomy of, uh, of households and uh, kin groups like lineages. And of course this is not, uh, uh, an uncommon pattern around the world, you know, that's where dynasties come from, is uh, you, that's how you get, you get, uh, you take a lineage and you, you pump it up to uh, an elite status. I think Chaco emerged from that kind of organization. Chaco was the closest thing we have to, a, I think, a hierarchical system in the, uh, at least in the northern southwest, uh, uh, during the period of occupation up there. Um, but in the northern Rio Grande, after about 1250 or 1270, both the existing population and new migrants were shifting to new forms of organization, exemplified by the Plaza Pueblo. Uh, that focuses on the, on the Pueblo, on the community, not on the individual components, at least as it is signaled archeologically. And again, that's what we have to work with, is how people, how people arrange their space, though, tells you a lot about how they, uh, how they organize themselves and how they think about their, uh, their community. Um, well, this may have been a pull factor. Uh, it may have been something that developed in part because of the need, has been argued, to integrate people coming in from a number of different areas. But uh, final question here, why did everyone mi migrate? Well, maybe it was a religious movement, but also maybe everybody didn't. But the people who migrate, you're going to walk a couple hundred miles. Um, typically, migrants tend to be the younger segment of the population. So the people who stayed uh, may have been, you know, most of them past reproductive age and things were getting worse. They were plunged into the so-called great drought full scale by 1280. Uh, Kristen Kuchelman has a paper in which she analyzes the uh, Hearth remains, the vegetal material from hearth, the last used hearth at San Canyon Pueblo, which was occupied right up to the end. And she finds a, a shift away from uh, corn, more wild foods, fewer turkeys, uh, definitely a, a, a shift that looks as if people were, were scrounging for, uh, for their subsistence. That's not the whole story, but uh, 
something like that may have uh, been going on. In the wake of this, in the wake of this uh, 1200s migration, the 1300s and 1400s were really a fluorescent period. Um, the old uh, archaeological uh, terminology called this uh, period the Pueblo Four period, regressive Pueblo, as opposed to the Great Pueblo. But in fact, this was a period of great uh, development, creativity, uh, fluorescence of art, ritual, organization in the Rio Grande. Um, this is some of the murals from a mural from Pottery Mound. So I think a lot of uh, the uh, Pueblo way of doing things in the Rio Grande, Pueblo way of uh, organizing themselves and, and practicing their religion, a lot of it uh, takes shape or at least got elaborated during this period. It undoubtedly has some roots back in the earlier periods as well, but I think this was a period of substantial change and, and creativity. It's much easier to uh, link uh, the ethnographic historic Pueblo way of life with this period than it is with the 11 or 1200s, uh, a point that a number of people have, have made. So anyway, I think that in the wake of these migrations, Pueblo communities of the northern Rio Grande and elsewhere developed ways to hold larger communities together without a strong central authority. Lexan argues that a lot of this is uh, in reaction to whatever it was that was Chaco, it was uh, too hierarchical. People had some, some people had too much power, set themselves above everyone else. Um, so, um, you know, I think that one of the ways the Pueblos historically have done that is by having organizations, religious and otherwise, that draw membership from across various kin groups. They get membership from various kin groups. And each of these organizations has a role to play so that you can't go it alone. If you're going to have a dance, you have to have several organizations. In the Tewa world, it would be both moieties, you know, have to play their role. They have to take their turn in, in, uh, in playing their role. And the the, Tewa, the the Northern Rio Grande, the, the Tanoans at least, have uh, the, sort of the ultimate term limits. They change their government every, uh, every, six, mo every six months to uh, give one moiety authority and then in the next moiety. So uh, they have these mechanisms for uh, keeping some subgroup in the community from getting too much, uh, too much power. Undoubtedly, um, Mesa Verde migrants changed some aspects of their culture, but they also undoubtedly retained many basic beliefs and cultural patterns. And undoubtedly, many of them, or some of these, if not many, persist among their descendants today. This is my friend, uh, Tessie Naranjo and her grandniece Rosie Simpson from Santa Clara. If you get a chance, uh, do a Google on uh, Visit with Respect. This is a really nice video about taking care of archaeological sites put together from the standpoint of uh, Pueblo people. Uh, and this photograph comes out of that. So I'll close here with a quote from Tessie, who are not surprised about movement. Movement is uh, part of us. People have moved from place to place and have joined and separated again throughout our past, and we've incorporated it into our songs, stories, and myths because we must continually remember that without movement, there is no life. So movement is life. So that's it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you mentioned they were predominantly dependent on maize. Did they not rotate crops? Because I know if you don't rotate crops, you exhaust the soil. Well, you, you know, the population, I don't think they would have to move after a while. That's a good point. Uh, and some people have suggested that. On the other hand, the yield was pretty low. You know, we're talking, uh, you know, a good Pueblo farm, uh, 10 bushels an acre, you know, uh, which doesn't take a lot out of the soil. The plants are very typically widely, very widely dispersed. But there was also, even, even in this time when there was a substantial population, um, there was a lot of land. Uh, Carla Van West study indicates that. But if you, have, if you have warfare going on and you don't want to get very far from the village, then you may not be able to rotate your crop. So that's a, that's a good... That's a, that's a good, a good point. Um, I don't. There, there may be some some good studies of that. Yeah, because if you have a combination of depleting the 
gain and you have uh, drought and you also don't rotate crops. Well, these guys are growing beans. These guys are growing beans along with the corn, you know. So beans is an important element of the diet, important source of vegetable protein. And, uh, you know, that, that does help uh, replace the nitrogen that the corn uh, takes away. So, you know, uh, it's one of those things that if you had, uh, 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 we have a Pueblo, Crow Canyon has a Pueblo farming experiment working mostly with Hopi farmers. They're interested in how you would farm up in that area and the archeologists are interested in how Hopi people with their accumulated knowledge of soils and water and crops and so forth would, would do it. They may be able to tackle that. I don't know where they are. I haven't been close enough to that project. Yes? Can you, uh, you if I understood you correctly, the household, several households in Manitoba. Typically, uh, one, you know, the typical ratio uh, in the 1200s is like four surface room, four or five surface rooms to one little kiva. So like one household per kiva. Maybe in some cases an extended family or, you know, you have uh, some relatives have moved, in-laws have moved in with you and that kind of thing. Can you speak to the organization of the household? I mean, it, does it have separated rooms? Have separated rooms, uh, typically uh, some clearly storage rooms that are usually the better built part of the complex, uh, tight to keep rodents out, keep weather out. And then uh, a few, one or two or three uh, living rooms, which may have been uh, basically where people lived in the summer and then sleep in the kiva in the winter. Sometimes they have cooking hearths, sometimes they don't. So the sleeping arrangement is it's sort of communal? Then? Well, it'd be a family, you know, I mean, uh, it was not uncommon when I, where I grew up in uh, rural Oklahoma for, uh, you know, people to have multiple people in the same bedroom, you know. I'm sorry, Sarah, my hearing is so poor. Oh, sorry. Speak up. Uh, Well, you know, warfare was going on down there too. So that's, uh, if you're gonna do that, uh, you're gonna need, need the troops, you know. So they may have been actually recruiting. One of the things you see that I didn't, didn't talk about uh, is that in the, in the Mesa Verde region, you see actually, one of the reasons you have such a high population density in there, there is that after about 1240, you get a lot of people are moving out of that lightly populated Western Mesa Verde area and either going south or they're moving into these big villages. And the, the bigger villages actually are coming closer together. So I think this sort of peer polity competition, which includes competition for followers. You can't be a leader if you don't have followers. You know? So the first way to get to be a leader is by getting some followers. So I think there may have been some recruitment of people, plus um, Aggregation into larger settlements is the best defense. You, you know, you can, if you're living one or two families in a canyon, as, as in southeast Utah, you're living way up in the, in the cliffs, you know, or you're building at least a place you can get to way up in the cliffs. But uh, if you uh, are in a village of 200, 300, 400, you have more security just by numbers. <coughs> Really? That picture was taken by a, a Flagstaff photographer named John Running sometime in the 1960s. And, you know, I, I, uh, I don't, um, I didn't look at it. I didn't know that, you know, that's. Uh, yeah, take a look. It's, one of them's got one horn, one's got two horns. Uh -huh. Hopi's do it today. He's a, the, the state museum used to have an enormous old cotton pot that had that uh -huh. theme on it. Every thinking possible will walk past it one day and say, oh, he said that's the one horn, two horn back. You do that up in Hopi now. Well, I think, I think there were, you know, there were, there were uh, uh, I don't know whether you call them movements or not, religions, whatever, you know, the, uh, the Salado thing that uh, Ar Archaeology Southwest has worked on so much. Uh, I don't think it was a matter of someone um, 
coming up centrally with a new way to do things. I think there were ideas that were coming in, getting reworked, integrated, new ideas being added, and then kind of uh, being adopted by uh, people in a number of different, more or less economically and politically independent communities, like the Kachina religion, which came in just a little bit later in the, in the, uh, in the northern uh, Pueblo world. Um, you know, that, you know, that didn't happen from a, uh, a central, uh, didn't happen from uh, the Vatican, you know, <laughs> something that, uh, that came in from, uh, and people reworked it in their own, uh, in their own ways. And there's, there's a lot, you know, I've treated the Pueblos as if they were a kind of monolithic entity. It's an enormous amount of variability. I mean, there are four different language families and uh, huge differences between East and West. But I think the idea that they're uh, using uh, membership in organizations that cross-cut your basic kin groups that tend to be the core of dynasties and elites, um, you know, I think that holds from east to west. Well, the plateau was where most of the farmland was, and most of the settlement is on the, on the mesa, you know, the, uh, even at people at Mesa Verde, they weren't farming down in the canyon there, they were farming up on top. And they were clearing their land, probably with the aid of fire. You know, it's the easiest way to get rid of uh, pinyon and juniper trees is to pile some sagebrush around the base and light it on fire. You don't have to cut them down, you know, because as long as you let the sun in and they're not using up water, you can uh, you can um, you can you can farm. Um, as far as as burning, it would be hard to burn the fields uh, when they're green at least, and even when they're at harvest time because the plants are pretty far apart. You know, it'd be hard to carry a fire in a field. Um, there is evidence from uh, the uh, studies that palynologists do where they core bogs and so forth that in this area when, uh, farm, when population ramps up, uh, charcoal uh, shows up in the cores at about the right time, indicating they were probably using, using uh, burning to clear trees, clear sagebrush, but picking up, uh, you know, warfare related burning, I think first it'd be hard to do and second it'd be such a such a short interval, I'm not sure it would show up in a, the kind of records we have. Yes? I heard a study which has shown that the incidence of parasites and pathogens in sheep increases dramatically as you go from top to bottom, bottom to top in the trash pile. Is there some evidence or can somebody look at that? Well, there are, um, when people move from a uh, foraging to a uh, farm to a sedentary, a mobile to a sedentary life, yeah, they definitely pick up different kinds of, of uh, parasites. That's been shown by Carl uh, uh, Reinhardt and others. The, um, uh, I think that the public health implications of these canyon head villages may have been a, a factor you know, in that uh, they're living right on top of their water supply. So, that, you know, I think that as opposed to living in a one or two household unit out on the, out next to the fields and walking a mile or two to get your water, people are living right on top of their water. So that may have had some effects on uh, population, the ability of population to rebound because of increased infant mortality. But that would have been a problem in a lot of places elsewhere as well. The Rio Grande, but you know, there's some there there are places elsewhere where people are living in fairly large concentrations, fairly close to their water 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 source. But it's one of the it's one of the downsides of uh, moving into a densely populated uh, uh, area. One of the reasons I think the Navajo population growth has was so so much more rapid. You know, there are about ten thousand Navajos and about ten thousand Hopi at uh, 1850. You know. <laughs> By 1950, there were about 10,000 Hopi and about 
150,000 Navajos. Uh, I think that, that dispersed pattern out on the landscape is a healthier pattern for infant survival. I've also heard that, that uh, Navajo uh, avoidance of the cities of the dead is because of this. Hmm. Habit. Could be, yeah, to move. But as, as Tessie Naranjo's uh, statement there uh, indicates, movement is something that people take for granted. Um, and uh, Mark Varian and his studies in the uh, Central Mesa Verde area showed that there's a lot of mobility at the household level. You know, once a family raises their kids and the kids start their own, they get their own place. And then, the, you know, so they move around that way. And then uh, they move in response to little variations in uh, the environment. And then periodically you get much larger scale movements. There was a uh, kind of a pre-play of uh, the 1200s uh, in the early 900s, you know, when population dropped dramatically in the Central Mesa Verde area. A lot of it went down to the San Juan Basin, down where, you know, the Chaco and other areas to the south. But movement was nothing, it was part of the history as, as, uh, as Tessie says in that in that in that statement. So, yes. Were these people all homogenous in the sense of being all Anasazi, or were they diverse in any way? Well, you know, the the, the language evidence today indicates that we're dealing with a really culturally diverse in the Mesa Verde region itself. I would suspect that uh, they had periods when they were um, dispersing and concentrating. They were bringing people in. Uh, one of the things that I didn't mention is that uh, these ways of doing things in the, in the, that emerged in the, after the migrations or during the migrations was ways to integrate people from very diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. But I think that, uh, you know, I don't have a, I don't know of data that would enable me to um, say anything very empirical about that, say for the early 1200s when population was building up. I would guess they came in from, there were people coming in from a number of different areas and becoming parts of these communities. Some people have, have speculated, and again, we don't have good evidence that when the Fremont area to the north, which was a huge area, agricultural, began to go down in the 1100s, that a lot of those people ended up in the Mesa Verde world. I mean, I've even read somewhere where maybe they even came down from Canada. Or from what? From Canada. Well, that's the, Nav the, Navajo, uh, the Navajo come down, the Athapascans come down, but probably based on the archaeological and linguistic evidence, not until the uh, late 1400s or 1500s. And then they did intermarry to some extent with Pueblo people, but that's after uh, this period. Of course, which is a, a point of dispute between Pueblo and Navajo people, as to who got there first and that sort of thing, but I... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to get into that, and I don't know enough about it to do that. Yes? I, I was wondering, um, to what degree do you think the warfare, in terms of drought, but also in terms of, what degree do you think the warfare aspect of it pushed the people out? That's what a lot of well, you know, if you have a battle, uh, somebody, uh, somebody loses and somebody wins, uh, you know, the winners presumably could stay. I think it was just, uh, it just made people miserable, you know, I think it made people uh, concerned. Uh, and I don't know that it's anything, uh, you know, if you read um, much history, you know, people kill each other a lot and uh, <laughs> I mean, they, get, they get used to it, they, they deal with it. But uh, I think it was, I think what's, what's surprising about the, uh, the Pueblo record is how little warfare there is, if you look at it cross-culturally. But there are periods where it really ramps up, and this seems to be one of them. I know in the San Pueblo, uh, San Canyon Pueblo, there's evidence of an enormous amount of violence towards the end. Yeah, uh, Castle Rock Pueblo is, is uh, just at the southern end of San Canyon, right down on the McElmo, about five miles from San Canyon. And there's evidence. But there's not enough, there's not evidence that everyone was killed at the end. There is evidence that some people died, probably violently. Some people died and were not immediately buried, but there's not evidence for a, uh, a, a total mass, a, a real massacre as I think uh, could be inferred for Castle Rock, which was a small settlement and maybe not a good idea to have, uh, you know, that small a settlement in this particular context. But what promoted those rivalries? Uh, I don't know. Um, 
I, I think that to some extent warfare feeds on itself. You know, once it gets going, then you have cycles of uh, revenge and retribution, and uh, it's a way for you know, young guys who do most of the damage and most uh, violence to prove themselves and uh, and so forth. So it's hard. To, it's hard to stop once it gets started, whether it starts over resources or uh, women or whatever. Okay. I'd like to say thank you to all of our sponsors, for all of you to come out today, and let's give Bill a big thank you. For <laughs>